All right, thank you all so much for joining us for a trip to Iceland with Jack Holmes. Iceland sits atop the North Atlantic Ridge, halfway between America and Europe. Uh, the country is sparsely populated and ruggedly beautiful. Uh, volcanoes under the glaciers make for interesting landscape and history. So we're gonna travel with Jack in the south and west of this land of fire and ice. Jack is a travel photographer and owner of Images from Near and Far at Western Avenue Studios in Lowell. A retired high school teacher, he previously served as president of the Greater Lynn Photographic Association, as well as the gallery manager of the Loading Dock Gallery in Lowell. And Jack regularly gives armchair travel presentations to senior centers and libraries in the area. So I again want to thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring and for Ashland, Hanover, and North Reading for spreading the word. So all 220 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jack for joining us this morning. And Jack, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, thank you all for Zooming with me and traveling to Iceland. And before we go, I should thank the uh, Tewksbury uh, Library friends and others and Corning. Uh, this is a, it's an amazing uh, set of performances that we have with this program. Anyway, off we go. I'll be traveling uh, to Iceland. I've traveled there a handful of times over the, the past few decades, couple of decades, little history. Uh, the earliest Norse explorations began in uh, 874 AD. Uh, Vikings came here in about the uh, 900s, late 900s. Marks you see along the map here are settlements that were there at the end of the millennium. You note the concentration of those here in the west and the, in the south. Uh, this is where we'll be traveling today. Sagas of the Norse settlers told of finding uh, Irish monks living there when they arrived. Um, these monks were thought to be uh, related to St. Brendan's voyages that began in the uh, seventh century. The red lines here along the coast are major paved roads. And you notice it particularly hugs the coast. Interior, we have some dotted lines, which are uh, unpaved roads. Uh, they really require four-wheel drive, and they're really difficult roads. By the way, it takes about 10 days to travel the ring road comfortably around the country. Uh, if you try and do it in less than, it's really, really um, a lot of driving and not much seeing. I traveled here within the blue lines uh, over the past two decades. In uh, July of 2017, my wife and I had a, a short uh, Reykjavik layover uh, after a North Atlantic cruise. And in uh, September 2014, we did a week layover in the countryside while we were on, uh, on an Icelandic air um, stopover uh, from a Norway to Boston flight leg. These uh, these trips brought back visits to old places and remembrances of some others. In, in June of 1997, I was on a two-week Earthwatch hydrology survey research trip in the region of Vatnjökull. And in 2000, my wife and I did a five-day Thanksgiving trip in and around Reykjavik and the Golden Circle. Um, Images from these, those trips are appearing in, in these images here. The older images are film and the modern images are digital. And you might recognize when some things look film and some things don't. Anyway, Iceland is a, a rugged volcanic landscape. All kinds of volcanic rocks are found here from porous pumice to glass obsidian uh, to blocks of basalt. Here on the southeast coast near Reykjavik, the landscape is a ragged lava landscape covered with lichen and woody, low woody plants. It looks cushy to walk on, but it's very, very difficult. Geothermal energy uh, powers the country. This facility is east of Reykjavik in Hengel, 
And it's uh, near the ring road, so people drive past this all the time. I believe it's actually called the Helshidi plant. It's one of the top 10 geothermal plants in the world. Uh, we drove by here a number of times. Uh, by the way, tours are available for this plant. This reminded me of our uh, November 2000 visit. And here we're at the entrance to the Blue Lagoon in November. Blue Lagoon is a geothermal plant. It's the outflow of a geothermal plant you see in the background. Much more picturesque and famous than the other one. Uh, water fields are warm and silky. Warm and silky. Now we're back outside after this morning and warmed and soothed. We're going to be on our way again. We snap back to uh, 2014 as we continue east along the ring road. On a farm near Selfoss, here's a herd of uh, Icelandic horses grazing. Near Hela, just off the ring road, is a Selyaland Foss. Foss means a waterfall. This foss, uh, you will get wet. Note that all the visitors are wearing rain gear and umbrellas as they take this walk around behind the waterfall counterclockwise trail. Waterfall itself is about uh, 200 feet high. It's very loud and it's uh, very wet. A lot of spray comes off these waterfalls and the wind will blow it around. These visitors have walked behind the waterfall and they're looking out down the valley through the water. Cool and wet behind the falls here. So if you have a camera, you need to keep it under cover until you're really ready to shoot. Then you shoot quick and then put it back under cover. And far from the waterfall, this is a, a quiet pool. It's uh, beside the outflow river. Vika Kirkja. This is the church at Vik. Kirk means church. See a lot of photographs of this particular church. It's very photogenic. And then out beyond it, you see some of the famous rock formations near Vik. But first, we're going to have to uh, see here, Rhinostranga and the Rhinosfjall. This is on a beach near Vik. Uh, legend has it that, that a couple of giants captured this three-mast schooner, and they were pulling it into the shore when the sun rose and froze them. I don't quite understand how the sun rising would freeze them. But anyway, that's the legend. That's the legend. But um, we'll visit that later. First, we're going we're gonna to have to go into Vic for dinner. Vic is a permanent resident population of about uh, 350. And this is the largest town in the region and attracts many tourists and, and has the usual tourist services. I would suggest, though, that it is uh, really recommended that you reserve sleeping accommodations well in advance in, in most of uh, tourists' favorite Iceland. Uh, it is a relatively uh, underpopulated country, so sometimes services can be a little bit iffy. We based ourselves here in Vic while we toured the southern region again. Dinner, Arctic cha, some lampfish caviar, and a Viking. Uh, fish and uh, lamb are quite common foods here. Lofskilavada is a it's a lava outflow ridge on the volcanic plain, to the thirty kilometers east of Vik, and we're heading off towards the glaciers in the background, in particular Skaftafell, cairns, and modern luck stones. Uh, in ancient times, travelers on the Mir the Salsanda would place stones on here to uh, in, ensure their safe crossing across the Sanda. By the way, a Sanda is a 
flat plain made of crinkly lava stone and uh, black sand. There's not a lot of views out here, and then what views you do have are pretty close to the ground and uh, make up vegetation and, and things of that nature. My wife's stone is placed, and so she is now safe to travel across the sander. And here we're stopping at Kirkikaba Kloster, or this is more commonly called Klosters. And I think you can see why pronouncing that name is somewhat difficult. This is Sister Foss. Foss, remember, is a waterfall. Uh, this waterfall comes from the plateau up top here. Sister Foss means uh, Sister Falls. <laughs> and refers to the Benedictine nuns who long ago had a convent here at Klosters. Well, it's time for us to go for a little hike. The trail winds up past this turf roofed barn on the hillside above Klosters. Nice views on the Tonle Plateau out towards the Atlantic across the sander. Nice views from this headland. Sister of Aten. Avaten is a lake. Uh, this lake is on the plateau and it becomes uh, two waterfalls. Uh, this is one of the tails of the waterfalls. This gentleman standing on the edge looking down. Lovely hiking up on top here. View to the south. This is a this is a farm at Klosters, beside the river Fossa. This is the outflow of the waterfall. Uh, words that end in a are likely rivers like Fossa. It's a waterfall river. Looking east over some more farms, the ring road here, the Sander, more outflow rivers. Uh, there are no long rivers in Iceland, though. They are mostly outflows from glaciers or waterfalls. In the background here is a southern uh, glacier called Vatnjökull. Jökull uh, is another word, is a word for glacier. This is the skier of the Sanda, Skaftafell, and the Vatnjökull behind. This is a, a mountain called uh, Avadna Shnuka. Here's the ski of the Sanda. This is outside the Skaftafell Park. There's a monument to a 1996 Yokolop with a twisted a bridge supports that are buried in the Sander. Uh, near it, there are signs about the 1996 Grimsvatten Yokolop. Grimsvatten is a slub, is a subglacial volcano. Uh, that's underneath the Vatn Yokel Glacier. And a Yokolop is a sort of a, a glacial tsunami that originates beneath the glacier. Uh, volcanism will kind of melt the underside of the glacier and it fills a subvolcanic, a subglacial lake. Now, this water level can rise and then flush the water out over the, the sander. Uh, this flushing out is called a yokolop. Uh, these things are not uncommon, but this particular one in 96 was uh, massive and very destructive. Nine, in, it happened in September when the eruption blasted through a thousand feet of uh, uh, glacier, rocks and ice plumes and ash plumes, disrupted air traffic quite a while. Ice blocks the size of uh, Gillette Stadium and the Prudential Building were blown off the glacier. The continuing eruption uh, melted the base of the glacier and it filled up the Grimsvatten, and the Yokolup swept out in uh, November of 96 and washed the massive ice blocks across the Sanda. Uh, this um, Glacial tsunami re-sculpted the Sanda and destroyed a large portion of the Ring Road Bridge. Uh, a temporary floating bridges were quickly reinstalled. 
um, out here across the Sonda. It's quite quiet now, but you do have to be careful because out across the Sonda with all the water, there were lots of uh, little bits of uh, quicksand, you know? Summer of 98, I was there with an Earthwatch uh, group doing research on the Yokolops path and on glacial hydrology in, in general. Our, our survey work was to uh, map out the damage and uh, look at the Sanders self-healing and look for locations where the Iceland Roads Department could build uh, future mitigation uh, features. The survey team is way back here on this uh, far bank in the center and the stake people had to walk across, walk across the center in a wide parallel tracks so that they could find high points that they could be mapped. <clears throat> uh, quicksand is, is kind of like ketchup. It, it's a colloid of a solid and liquid that won't liquefy until there is some kind of disturbance on it. Uh, the si this sign was near the temporary floating bridge. Let me go back there for just a second. Temporary floating bridge, and they tell you to stay off the, they want to discourage people from going out there. If a person sinks in, it's usually only about ankle deep. It's kind of like sands on some of the beaches around here. Uh, you could possibly sink into your knees. Now, for those who did, it was the best way to do it was to lay down on your back and float, and then slowly, gradually raise your legs by bending your knees and curling your toes because you needed to keep your boots on. And then you would kind of backstroke to get to a drier land. <laughs> Photo here in 1998 from a publication. This is the sander, and this was the bridge that kind of got washed away. Top photo is, is some of that uh, support material that was washed that was in the sander. This is the temporary floating bridge, one lane wide with pullouts. Um, if you were going uh, west, you had the right of way. Klaus's headland is went back here in the background. Turning around, we're heading uh, east to Skaftafell. It can be a long, windy and lonely road out here on the Sander. It also can be rather dangerous. This particular uh, four-wheel drive had a rollover. No one was injured, but it really messed up their uh, vacation. Skaftafell yokel. Uh, this, is a, this is part of the Vatten yokel. A uh, very popular national park. A bus from Reykjavik will stop here at least once a day and sometimes twice. Uh, in the summer of 98, uh, we camped here while we did the Earth Watch work. This campground at Skaftafell. Skaftafell Yokel in the foreground. Havadnushnukar in the background on, on the Vatten Yokel. This is the highest mountain in, in Iceland, by the way. This is our home for two weeks. We cooked and uh, ate and met in these white tents, and then we slept in these two-person tents. The view of the our campsite from the headlands out across the Sander. Looking back across the campground, this is the bathhouse, Skafta Falyoko and Havadna Schnooker in the background. Twilight at this time of the year in June was about uh, 3.30 in the evening, the morning. So uh, we could have midnight Frisbee games. On the weekends, it was okay because people were all up quite late at night anyway. This amazing light we had some two o'clock in the morning on Havad Mishnuka. I think you would call it Alpine Glow. This is a midway between Klausters and then the new bridges, 19, the 1783 Lockie eruption left this sander near the, nearby the river Giga. 
1998, I tried to drive out this uh, road in the rental car. Um, it was not a good idea. So we stopped and I, I took a picture of the some of the lowland vegetation and turned around and went back. Uh, not a good road. In 98, uh, four-wheel drive Land Rovers, it was a, a rocky road to get out there. This stream here is a glacial outflow that eventually flows into the Giga that eventually did wash away some of the ring road. It was cold in June when we were there. Uh, wind blows down off the glacier. Around here, we get what we call a, a sea breeze. When the land gets warm and the air rises, and then the water, uh, the wind off the ocean would come in, cool it down. Now that that's a that's a sea breeze. Well, here, when the water, when the land rises, the air rises off the black sander, a wind blows down off the glacier, some 30, 35 miles an hour, and it's off the glacier, so it's really quite cold. This is the snout of the glacier at this particular location. And contrary to labels on water bottles, glacier water is not clear. It's uh, gray, typically laden with uh, what's called rock flour. Here we're sampling some water, pH and temperature. The water is, uh, researchers are interested in the age of the water and the possible mineral signature of the outflow. Uh, how long had that water been out of contact with the air? And what kind of stone was it, uh, what the glacier carrying? The glacial outflow uh, here might have been related to the Lackey eruption from some 1783. Radioactive isotopes of oxygen and carbon contained in the water and dissolved carbon dioxide were to be tested for age of the glacier. Uh, dissolved minerals in the ground stone flower could indicate the subglacial geology. <clears throat> this water testing equipment was um, a mini chemistry lab. We filtered the water, isolated the stone flower, stored it and the clear water samples in separate sealed vials. Uh, these were taken back to England to be analyzed. Tests from previous years show glacier water ice had been incorporated into the glacier probably on the order of 500 to 1,000 years ago. There's a lot of nice uh, hiking around Skaftafell. Then and no. We're above the campground on the headlands looking out across the Skierdara. Skierdara. That's the, that's the river. And we're heading back into the uh, distant waterfall back here. It comes off the top of the Vatmyokel. This particular canyon is, is guarded by trolls. We're heading to this foss, which is way in the back coming off the Vatmyokel for a private swim. In the sun, it was really a toasty 70 degrees. No wind. Oh, it was absolutely lovely. Lovely. Back 2014 here, these folks are standing on a, on a former terminal moraine off the glacier. This is the glacial snout covered with rock. It's retreated about uh, a quarter of a mile since I was there in 98. Still, it's rock covered with a uh, lake in the front of it, little bergy bits floating. Scott the Fell is the furthest east we went on this particular trip in 2014. Leaving it, we're driving back west towards Vic. This is the new bridge over the Giga. It's uh, kind of like a Lego like construction with wider supports, and it's been stabilized upstream flows west of Vic, the Rhinus Fjall. Oh, this is Halsan Efshila, Halsan Efshila, and the Rhinus Fjall. 
This beach, by the way, is uh, rated one of the top 10 non-tropical beaches in the world. Rhinus Fiara. This is the cave, and this is the, the beach. Rhinus Donga out here in the back. It's a main stop for visitors and tours out of Reykjavik. So I always have to dress for wet here. I've been here three times and it never was sunny. Rained once, but uh, never sunny. A lot of drizzle. These basalt rocks are covered with drizzle. And these are me and the reflections here in the rock. They have to be dangerous here. By the way, note number 1112, 112, that's Europe's uh, version of our 911 emergency calls. You always have to be careful here. Always have to watch and careful on the beach. Halsana Fila at the base of the Rhinus Fjell. These are hexagonal basalt columns. Note the size of the people down in the bottom here in Parison. These blunt hexagonal needles are the same columnar rock feature that makes up a giant causeway in Northern Ireland. Uh, they're volcanic, vertical, and Iceland in, in uh, Giant's Causeway, you walk on the surface. Long, long time, these things crystallize underground. Here we're inside the sea cave. Base of the uh, columns have been eroded away by sea erosion. Back on the beach. These are lava. These lava stacks are actually erosion remnants of the Rhinus Fjell. Uh, besides giants, legends say that the trolls were involved in these formations. So giants, trolls, take your pick. Or you could be a geologist and choose erosion off the Rhinus Fjell. Draholi. This is Draholi. It's on a headland uh, west of the Rhinosphera. To get to it, you have to go, it's an hour drive back out to the ring road and down the ring road and then back out the other peninsula, out the other headland. Sometimes it's quite foggy out here and the going can be rather slow. The willet on a fence. Little fog break here. Then you get closer to the shore, the land changes again. I wonder what kind of legends uh, made these rock formations. Finally, finally, we're way out. 180 degree view from Drina and Dry Holly back to the Rhinus Fjall and the Rhinus Dranga. When you're out in these places, uh, don't forget to look down, look closely, see what's around you. There's more than just you know, big landscapes. Interesting mid shots and close ups. Okay, we're going back out to the ring road. Trio of Icelandic horses welcome us back to the ring road. Ring road's not a big road, by the way. It's about two lanes wide all the way. And across the road, across the road, you could hear this uh, sound of rushing water. It's coming off one of the glacial fosses. And then on the other side, you could hear some sheep. Hear some sheep barring. Uh, Skogafoss, uh, continuing west and uh, just off the ring road near Skoga is Skogafoss. This was the ancient coastline, a real particular point, and the Atlantic is some three miles south of here. And Skogafoss reflected. This one, for me, it's one of the most beautiful waterfalls I've seen in the country. In the sunlight, there is a, a beautiful little rainbow that, on the top of this thing. 
uh, but not today. It's it's kind of drizzly. You can climb the trail that goes beside the foss, 82 foot high. And then there's a hiking trail that goes way back to the north from here. Uh, no rainbow today, but there is spray on the lens of my camera as I'm standing in the Skoga. Okay, another waterfall. This is Gulfus. This is north of the ring road. So this is the ring road here. So Skoga Foss is gonna be back on the interior. <clears throat> Almost every Icelandic tour will give you a stop at this particular waterfall. Regardless of the weather and regardless of the uh, temperature, they're going to stop here. Double level waterfall, very loud, and a lot of mist, especially if the wind is blowing right, the mist is a lot of spray. <laughs> When it's below freezing, uh, this spray can uh, freeze on contact and make everything uh, quite icy. 2000, and when we were there in late November, it was quite cold. Uh, freezes on the walkways and so makes walking somewhat uh, iffy. If you have some micro spikes, it's probably a good idea to have them with you if you're there in the winter. Uh, but we were here in the summer, September, actually, a lot of times. Really quite lovely. A lot of wet, a lot of sound. Oh, continuing on the Grand Circle route here, we're going to be heading to Geyser, past this uh, barn that's built into a turf hill. Geyser Basin here. Geyser and Stroker are, are two of the... Uh, geysers on this particular private land. Geyser, yeah, that, that's how the real one is spelt. And they all get their name from this particular feature. And like all geysers, it is really hot. The water, this is the boiling point of water, so that these are not, um, these are not things to be played with. You can get quite close to them here, uh, this is when this geyser is not as active as Stroka, but when this begins to bubble, you better back up because this one is higher than Stroka. Uh, wind will kind of blow its uh, uh, spray around, comes down, it's warm, but it's not that hot. Not anywhere near as pretty as Stroka. Uh, stroke here, we have Stroka at about two in the afternoon in November, so we're getting nice light. It has two spouts, I'm making it much more photogenic than geyser. Um, these are this whole basin is on on private land. Uh, historically, um, these isolated farms and isolated locations, uh, you were obligated to house and feed uh, visitors who happened on your space. Since these are these geological features are rather popular. The people who own this were sometimes put upon. Uh, now, and uh, this land is, uh, we would call it public access, but no longer are these people obligated to house and feed visitors. Um, there is, uh, I don't recall having paid anything at parking or any kind of uh, entrance fee to get out here. Still continuing on the golden circle or at Thingvala. And this is Thingvala Vatten. Remember Vatten? Vatten was a lake. This is geologically and historically significant. Uh, the Mid Atlantic Ridge goes right down here on land. The North American continental plate is on the western side and the European continental plate is on the eastern side. And so Iceland kind of adds another inch or so a year to the land. And so it's a growing land. New land is, comes up between. It also comes up in other active fissure regions. Uh, right now, there's one uh, not too far from uh, the Blue Lagoon. Here at uh, Thingvilla, 
it was very wet over here in 2014. Wet and windy. And it's like that. It's sometimes useful to see what the what's happening at your feet. The Logberg at Alting. This was founded in 930. It was the home of the annual Icelandic parliament until a union with Norway in the 13th century. Uh, Tingvala uh, translates to uh, parliament plain and the law was recited against the rock and it would echo back to the assemblage behind the speaker. This is the logberg that the, where they would speak to and it would bounce back off of that. The law was recited in thirds or from memory. And so it was a three year cycle. The central historic district is actually on the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge and these islands, hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat was settled uh, disputes out there back in the day, in the 900 thousands. Not now, the conferences are held out here. There's a church that's out here in the chapel. These chapels tend to be mostly used for um, ceremonies, weddings, and uh, funerals, and baptisms, possibly. Old cemetery here in, on this particular district. A wet boardwalk. Each time I was here, it was very wet from either rain and or the spray that came off of this foss that's coming off the North American plate. A lot of noise, a lot. Of, the wind is blowing right. The stuff really comes out across here. There's a fossa. You can notice some people way up here on the hillside who were out, out hiking. Thing all about, and this is a repeat view in the same place a few years ago. Late November, sun rises after 10.30 in the morning. Um, sunset is about 4 p.m. I have to move closer to the camera because I noticed I was flickering like I was going in and out. Anyway, so with, with the weather permitting, uh, this is an amazing light over this place. Typically, Thingvalavatn is the last stop on your Golden Circle Vista tours. And an hour or so or later, you'll be back in your hotel in, in Reykjavik. Uh, we, on the other hand, are going to be heading northwest northwest out towards uh, Snafelnes Peninsula. In particular, we're heading for the town of Stikasoma. Stikasoma population of about a uh, thousand. <laughs> West end of the peninsula, there is a uh, Snafes for Yokel. Volcano is under there as well. <laughs> this is the location of Jules Verne's voyage to the center of the earth. For us, it was hidden, and we never saw the center of the earth. In town, a lot of mushrooms as we're walking along the road from our hostel. We're on our way to dinner. I don't know if these mushrooms are edible or not. I never saw them on a menu. But lamb and lentils were there, and another Viking. Again, fish and lamb, most popular uh, at meals. This is a protected home at Stickers Hall, protected harbor. You can walk out here up on the headland, up on the headland to this uh, lighthouse. Well, actually, it's not so much a lighthouse as it is just a, a kind of a beacon that looks out. Looking back across the harbor to Stickersholmer, and in the background you see another fjall. This fjall is called Dropolitha Fjall. We call it fjall as a headland. Little bits of sun coming out here as we're working our way back.
the light is amazing when that sun comes out. Uh, it can now, because you get the yellows and the blues, these particular colors and the greens. It's a beautiful light out here. Uh, Urbigya. Uh, this sign refers to uh, the saga of the Berserk brothers. These were badass guys. Uh, if you disagreed with them, they would beat you up or kill you. By the way, this is the source of the term to go berserk. Kolgafa Fjord, near the Grunda Fjord. A fjord is a, a glacial filled valley surrounded by mountains and, and open to the sea. By the way, how are you doing with your, uh, with your pronunciation here? Sunburst here through the crowds, through the clouds. There are some dairy farms out on snuffleness. I note the milk can here that's ready to be picked up by the co-op. Milk cans would go into this particular chest. Ooh, and notice we have a rainbow after the rain. Uh, in town, the rain, the this rainbow lasted about an hour, and the town librarian said. Uh, we get a lot of long-lasting rainbows here. A lot of long-lasting rainbows, but no pot of gold. Far west of the peninsula, we got to Dritvik. Had a little weather break here, so we decided to do a little hike out towards the harbor at Dritvik. Note these four big stones here. These are on, this, on the beach, at the top of the beach. The four lifting stones, a kilogram is 2.2 uh, pounds. So a 23 kilogram rock is 50 pounds and 154 kilograms is 339. <laughs> if you were gonna be rowing the boats in and out, you had to be able to lift this 54 kilogram rock and put it on top of a three foot high platform. 54 kilos is 119 pounds. Dritvik Harbor, guarded by another troll. There's the small landing beach that you have to row in, into and out of. Which stone is yours? That's the one you have to lift to be rowing. Now, we saw Dritvik. We never saw so Snaffles Yokel that Vern, Jules Vern was at. But here at Anastapi, we had some kind of rain and start, no rain and rain and no rain. Uh, Snaffleness Peninsula catches the weather off of the Atlant North, North Atlantic. Makes for an interesting set of views. And we had a break here. Again, isolated house. Here are some fosses coming off the fjalls. Rake. Rake means steamy. Holt means hill. We chose a, a scenic road to uh, Rake Holt uh, before heading to Reykjavik. Remember what Vic is? Anyway, we chose this because it was uh, somewhat pretty. We had some nice weather. Note the farms, isolated farms out here, which accounts again for why you were somewhat responsible for um, accommodations and food to travelers. Which way is the uh, wind blowing? The Kirk at Rayholt. Uh, it's lunchtime in Rakel. Uh, an Icelandic favorite, a pulsa. A pulsa is a foot long hot dog. Uh, it's made with lamb and pork and beef in a natural casing. 
They are typically boiled to keep them tender yet snappy when you bite them. These are topped with uh, Icelandic mustard and a mayonnaise roumelade uh, wrapped here in a flatbread. You can get them in hot dog buns and you can add onions and ketchup if you want. Uh, these things are found at all kinds of roadside stands around the country and at gas stations as well. Fall. This is Rowan. Uh, actually, we probably know this as mountain ash. Fall is a lovely time to be in Iceland. Corona fossa, September foliage. The waterfall here comes from uh, underneath the topsoil. You can see it under the topsoil, it comes. Note the color of the glacial river. Gray, not clear. The trail, the trail here we were on was a, a ropey lava bed. Uh, temperature and gases influence the uh, lava type. Uh, lava types are usually identified with Hawaiian names. Uh, if it is cools slowly and doesn't move too fast and is not stirred up, it forms a smooth and ropey one called pohoihoi. However, if it moves quickly and is jiggled and bounced around, it tears into crinkly pieces called aha. This is what the pohoihoi looks like. We saw some of this done on the big island in Hawaii. But anyway, we're heading to Bonifoss. Bon is a child. Uh, 12 centuries ago, uh, two children who were running and chasing fell to their death into this particular uh, foss on uh, Christmas Day. We we're heading back out over the Pohoihoi, heading back out to the uh, view that we had before, view of the foss. September is a lovely time to be uh, traveling in Iceland. All right, we're heading back into, we're heading into Reykjavik. This is the country's uh, center of activity with half of the population uh, living here in the greater Reykjavik. Um, it's not a particularly large city, but the size of Portland, Maine, or, or maybe Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, mix of modern and old buildings. This is a newer section uh, of the city and turn 180 degrees and you have the sculpture that is now iconic for Iceland. Sculpture beside the new museum and music hall on the western part of the waterfront. This particular part now is where the small pleasure craft are located, modern sailing craft. And I love the Reflections of the water, it looks like abstracted floating script art. I turned it here sideways, but I can't read it. In downtown, the old city, the famous church up, up this particular street. I'm not gonna try and say the name of this particular street, but the church is called Hagrunskirka. It's a modern uh, evangelical Lutheran church. It's not the city's cathedral as some writings say. The facade is uh, reminiscent of geological features of the country, the basalt columns that we've seen on the Rhinus Fjata. 240 foot, 44 foot tallest building in the country and one of the iconic symbols of, of Iceland. Symbol of the statue here is uh, the Viking Leif Erikson. This particular gentleman is getting his uh, selfie taken with the uh, church and Leif Erikson probably be beside him. You know, this is open for tours. And in 2000, uh, November, we did go up to the top of it. This is just after four o'clock and just after the sunset. And here we're looking to the southwest uh, across the old city, to the old harbor out here. 
some of the newer buildings we saw coming in down in this section here, looking to the southeast over the harbor, to the mountains beyond. You come out of the church and you turn around and walk into the city, and this is what it is. This is the old residential area just opposite the church. This uh, store had benches and a couple of tables for takeout, picture menu. Um, look at that. This particular sign, you've got 12 languages on this sign, for your Coca-Cola sign. And then this is sign, what they were selling for food. Uh, they still work with uh, Krona for their money. Um, Iceland is a somewhat of an expensive place to visit, um, so you do have to pay attention to your money. Modern street art in the modern city. This is the old section. This is over near our hostel. It was on the eastern waterfront section. Lovely spaces out here. And these are um, really metallic sheets. Old parts of the city really quite attractive, <clears throat> but they definitely don't look like um, here in the U.S. They make it look quite lovely. A duster. A duster. This rental car has been out in the countryside. Uh, from experience, I can tell you, be sure that you are insured against windshield damage. Um, here it's essential that you photograph your car clean when you pick it up and be sure you photograph the windshield uh, and then photograph it again when you return it. On the eastern side, quiet part of the waterfront, a lot of the boats are out to sea working. This is the working waterfront section. Reflections in the windows of the landscape in the background. Heading to Keflavik for our flight home. Keflavik means uh, driftwood. It's on the Reykjanes uh, Peninsula. Keflavik Airport was built in about the 1940s, staffed by the USA until about 2006. It's uh, now an international airport and hub for uh, Iceland Air. 45 minute ride from Kefla, from Reykjavik on the fly bus. Uh, Blue Lagoon is, is located near here as well in Grindavik. If you have a four hour layover at Keflavik, it's worthwhile to take a little tour down here. You may notice the uh, in recent news that there is an eruption taking place in this particular region here, this is a region is where there is, um, it's really not inhabited, but there's a lot of hiking near this particular uh, volcano. It's been active the last few years. So new land is being built on the Reykjanes. Okay, we're back on the road. Uh, bonds again, built into turf. Bonds are actually not individually large like we would be used to here in the US. The bonds are for our animals in the winter time. Sheep, very common, very common here for wool, for our Icelandic sweaters and hats and things, and for meat. What? Meat? Yep. Gata Skagi, and near Gata. Uh, there used to be an airport out here uh, before Keflavik northwestern corner of the peninsula, tall uh, water, uh, tall light tower. Okay, we're gonna head back to Keflavik, get a car wash, fill a gas tank, photograph it and return it. Uh, we stayed at a hotel that was once part of the, mili the American military installation. Uh, the rental returns are there as well. And then you get a shuttle to the airport. Return flight to uh, Boston is about a four hour flight. Um, yeah. Thanks for returning to Iceland with me.
If you have any questions, uh, I can certainly try and answer them now. I do need to go back to Iceland because I have not yet seen the uh, Northern Lights there. All right, folks, let's give Jack a bit. Oh, sorry, Jack, I stepped on your toes there. No problem. Right. They, they can read that. You can get in touch with me at jackholmes at yahoo.com. Come visit me at my studio at Western Avenue. I'm there if there's uh, any first Saturday, but I'm not traveling. You can stop in and see me. Uh, my recent photography you can find on Facebook as images uh, from near and far. Sorry, Robert, I interrupted you. No, Ken, I, uh, uh, Jack, I interrupted you, so I, I apologize there. Uh, but you finished right on time. Excellent. Let's give Jack a, a big virtual round of applause, everyone. And let's take uh, roughly 15 minutes of questions. Uh, Jen, uh, uh, Ken says, good job on the pronunciations. I know that uh, those can be tough, Jack. You, you handle yeah. it like a champ. My, uh, my, Dave, my, yeah. ang my Anglo-Icelandic. There you go. Uh, David says, we spent two weeks driving all around the Ring Road in uh, 2018. It's, wow. a, it's an amazing country. We love the waterfalls. Driving is easy except for all the sheep on the road. Yeah. Uh, John asks, could you please tell us the temperature for some of the scenes you photographed? When I was there in June of 98, uh, we were working, so the temperatures out on the sand, it could be down in the 50s with a wind chill. But if you got into sheltered spaces like we were swimming, it could be 70, 71, 72. Um, it doesn't sound like hot, warm, but for us, it was really warm and, and it was not a problem to take your clothes off and go swimming. Um, I don't recall it being very hot. I would say that uh, Weather-wise, it feels like, say, New England, and uh, yeah, like New England. Janice also uh, gives you a tip of the cap, says you're pronouncing, pronouncing those difficult words well. Uh, John wants to know, were there many trees in Iceland? No, trees are, are not... You have to find some really sheltered spaces in order to have trees. Um, I don't have a good explanation for it, but long, long ago, I was told that the sheep ate the low-lying vegetation, and so mm -hmm. trees never got a chance to grow unless they were sheltered away from the animals. Uh, Margaret says, lots of info coupled with dramatic photos. Thank you. Mike says, great talking photos. We've been to Iceland twice but we still learned a lot from this program. I'm very impressed with Jack's ability to pronounce the names. Uh, Karen says, thank you. Ken says, very informative. Laura says, beautiful photos. Linda says, this was wonderful. Claire says, uh, thank you so much for having a cursor. Uh, we could easily spot things. Uh, Cheryl says, extraordinary photos and presentation. Teresa says, wonderful. Anne says, always interesting talks. Elaine says, enjoyable and informative. Cheryl says, thanks. Jody says, she can't wait to go to Iceland. Amazing photos. So Eileen asks, when is the best time to visit Iceland? Well, I've been there in June, August, September, and November. Uh, I would I would suggest that uh, September would be lovely because then now you're going to get some foliage. Uh, Iceland Air will, will be happy if you took their airplanes and stopped off there for a period of time as you're going back and forth to Europe between the U.S. Um, I'd go back in September, but I'd also would try and go there in the winter because I've not yet seen the uh, northern lights in Iceland. I've seen them in Norway, but not Iceland. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Jean says, wonderful presentation, super photos. Donnie says, excellent presentation. Thank you for a wonderful travel log. Uh, let's see, Jody says, what sites and museums should we see in the capital if we're there only for a few hours? Oh, I'm not sure about that, but if you are there for only a few hours and you get a chance to go to the Blue Lagoon, 
I think that's uh, interesting, very interesting. Uh, it's a 45 minute drive one way on the bus to, to Reykjavik. So I think it'd be hard pressed to go into the city and back out. Um, long ago, there was supposedly a penis museum there. I don't know if it's still there or not. I've never been. I don't know. Uh, and wait, wait a minute. The, there is a there is a uh, fine art museum on the eastern side near our hostel, and that was quite lovely. And there's the new uh, museums uh, on the western side art museum. So if you're there for more than a uh, it's just a quick stopover. Well, the museums along the waterfront are kind of nice, worthwhile. Uh, Anne wants to know, did you speak any Icelandic when you traveled there? We have a similar question. An anonymous attendee asks, is English sufficient to be well understood all over Iceland? Do people there appreciate even poor attempts at speaking Icelandic? Um, the only Icelandic I have really is, is is attempting to pronounce some of the names. Um, English was the language that I heard all the time. Uh, I, I would I, I would think Icelandic Icelanders speak Icelandic to each other, but uh, English is is a more than a strong second language. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, "How expensive is it to travel on your own versus with a tour company?" And how far in advance should one make plans for accommodations? Iceland, like a lot of those countries, is rather on the expensive side. Uh, since I never really traveled uh, with a, well, we, we took a tour, a Golden Circle tour once, but that's, uh, I can't tell you what the prices are. You'd have to look at them online. We traveled independently, rental car, Gasoline's expensive, so get a small one, uh, manual if you can drive it. Uh, Icelanders will oftentimes buy food uh, at, at markets and do picnicking, and they might do, uh, if they're going out drinking or something, they might have a beer or two before they went out, because in, in places, beer is, liquor's expensive. It's an expensive country, but uh, really, it's an amazing space to go. I, I would check everything online ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> certainly accommodations, certainly accommodations. So just to reiterate, because we've got this question multiple times, when is the best time to travel to Iceland? And is there any time you advise not to visit Iceland? I, th I don't think I'd go there in late winter and early spring, because now it's gonna be the remnants of winter cold, wet. Uh, I don't think, I don't think I'd want to be there, say, February through April, January, I'm not sure. Hmm. December might be nice because it's so dark, you might get a much more chance to see the, uh, the uh, northern lights. It's going to be cold, going to be cold like, like Maine, like Maine in the wintertime. Well, Robin asks, how cold can it get in Iceland? It's not really as cold as you might think because the, the um, <clears throat> Gulf Stream goes up just at the bottom of Iceland, so it brings somewhat warm air up there. So as I said, it, 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 I would think of its weather as, as somewhat like Maine, Nova Scotia in the wintertime. And speaking of Maine, Frank wants to know, how far is Iceland from northern Maine? Mm. Distance-wise, I'm not sure, but airplane-wise from Boston, it's four, four and a half hours. So it's not particularly far. And, and uh, I think if you were flying Aer Lingus to, to uh, Ireland, I think that's about a six and a half hour flight. The, uh, uh, Lewis wants to know, do you happen to know the population size of Iceland? I'm gonna say about half a million, two thirds of a million. And again, more than half, about half of it is Gradia Reykjavik. And at one particular point, they said Reykjavik was a third of the population. And at that particular time, they were talking about uh, 300,000. 
Kathleen says, fabulous talk and photographs. Thank you. Mariette wants to know, is there a good place in Iceland to do some bird watching? Yes, there is. Uh, I not, that's not my skill. I don't have the equipment, all the patience to do that. Um, I, I would recommend uh, investigating uh, online to see what possibilities are there. Um, there are probably puffins. There, there could be gannet. I don't. I don't know. I honestly don't have a good answer for that one. Uh, Marianne says, "Great photos, great narrative." Mariette really enjoyed this. Virginia says, "Great photos." Uh, Jeff says, "Great presentation." Linda hopes to go one day. Uh, Judy says uh, she uh, recommends the Lava Museum. Uh, Jody just did a, a tour, uh, I'm sorry, a cruise uh, covering the west, north, and east sides of Iceland. And uh, this program completed our views of this interesting country. Uh, Frank says, bravo, stunning photography as usual with great geological context, including in your beautiful presentation. Thank you again. Uh, Donnie would like to know, have you traveled to the northern part of Iceland? No, yeah. no. The very, very northern island is just above, it, it, well, the Arctic Circle cuts it. And at one particular point when I was thinking about having to get the Arctic Circle, I thought about going there. But instead, we were in Norway and it was way north of the Arctic Circle there. So I have not been in the north, and I really would like to do that. I Curie is supposed to be kind of interesting, and then the island above it, well, chess is a big deal up there. I'd like that. I'd be interested to do that. Did you photograph any puffins while you were there? No, I didn't see any birds except for a couple of gulls <laughs> and a willet on the on a on the on the fence. Uh, Mary says you referenced something about uh, the danger about a windshield. So well, what did you mean by that? There are a lot of rocks on the road uh, and they get thrown up. And, and if they hit your windshield, they're going to give you a little ding on the windshield. So when we brought back a car uh, in 2014, it had a ding there. Uh, I don't recall having experience it, but the car company charged me $500 for it. Fortunately, I did have secondary coverage on a credit card, and fortunately, I did photograph it and had all the paperwork and submitted it properly to the credit card company and was covered and was returned my money. But um, there are a lot of road hazards there. You need to protect yourself. Protect yourself when you go to Iceland. Stay on the main roads too, by the way. Uh, Teresa says, what did you say Vic means? I missed it. Uh, thanks for a great trip. Vic means harbor. Harbor. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, it seems that it, it's always rainy and muddy. What gear should I prepare, prepare when I go? Well, it's not always rainy. It's uh, um, some of the interesting photographs were in the rain or the messy bits. But no, it's not always rainy. Not always. Uh, Stephen has a history question. Uh, has Iceland always been an independent country or was it a colony of some European country? No, it was uh, independent, I guess, until uh, it associated with Norway in the 13th century. And then at some particular point, it was associated with Denmark. So I guess you would say it would be territories of those spaces. And off the top of my head, I don't remember when it became a, a independent country. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Uh, David warns that the wind is sometimes so intense that it can rip the doors off of your car. Uh, I don't know if you've experienced any of that, Jack. Uh, and Betsy says, thank you for a great presentation. No, uh, we one time when we were waiting to be picked up by the Land Rover and that Icelandic wind was blowing at like 35 miles an hour. Mm. That black sand would get in your nose and then get on the edge of your eyes, hit to close your eyes, and, and they clogged up the zippers of your jacket. 
And we had to lay on the a depression area so we would kind of stay out of that blown sand. It was oh, it was messy. <laughs> right, so it, it's uh, so it's eleven forty-five. Let's take two more questions. Uh, and uh, let me I'll save that one for the end, I guess. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks: Is visiting the Blue Lagoon worth the expense and travel time to reach it? Uh, it's been a long time since I've been there, but uh, when we were there, you did have to go into the shower rooms, take a shower before you went to the Blue Lagoon, and you take a shower when you come out because of the silica on the water. Uh, mm -hmm. Warm, pleasant, lovely, silky water, lovely stuff. It's worth a try. And our last question goes to Anne. Uh, I asked you if you took any photographs of any puffins, Jack. Anne would like to know, did you eat any puffins while you were there? I guess they are on the menu. No, I saw nothing. How, how was the food, Jack? Good, good. You do have to like lamb and fish. Uh, that's not that expensive. They do a very nice job with that. Uh, beef, uh, I didn't. Eat local, drink local, sleep local is kind of a mantra. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to be eating beef and chicken there. Lamb and fish are the things you go for. So folks, let's give Jack a big virtual round of applause for a great presentation and Q&A. Uh, I don't have it booked yet, but I'm sure we'll see Jack again in the fall uh, next. Uh, and Jack, I'll circle back to you in one second. Uh, but uh, next uh, Tuesday, uh, July 25th at 1030, uh, we're taking an armchair travel uh, to Prague, and we're going to be joined by a Prague tour guide uh, who will be zooming in from Prague. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, and uh, so folks, look for an email from me later today, recording, feedback survey, information about our other upcoming virtual armchair travel programs. Jack, do you have any last words for the audience before we wrap it up? Thank you all for tuning in. It was lovely to go back and I need to go back soon. So until next time, travel light, wear a smile. All right, thanks so much, Jack. And I hope everyone, uh, including Jack, has a great rest of their day. Bye-bye.